Good afternoon. So today, I'd very much like to talk to you about some of the work or some of the causes and concerns we have behind batteries. But more specifically, I'd like to throw out the question, can batteries drive us to a greener future? Now, I was born in the 1970s, a very long time ago. Back then, so this was one of the first Motorola prototype mobile phones and the kind that was continually developed throughout the 80s. So I remember seeing Michael Douglas holding one of these things in the film Wall Street and thinking, how is that possible? If somebody had told me that in 2019 we'd have this sort of phone that you could literally just tap on, I would have thought, that's the realm of Star Trek. Really? Here we are. We have computers that we can hold. So back in the day, back way back then, this sort of battery pack was needed to power mobile phones. And these were really heavy. These days, we have things that the size and weight of a thin chocolate bar. And that's why our phones are very powerful now. To put it into context, so iPhone is millions of times faster, uh, more powerful a computer than that that would have been used to power the Apollo 11 moon landing. It's pretty incredible stuff, right? That was before lithium-ion technology. Lithium-ion technology was a real game changer. For those of you who go on to study chemistry and electrochemistry, you become familiar with the pioneering work done by electrochemists such as Michael Faraday and Alessandro Volta. This show is called the Voltaic Pile and was one of the first batteries developed many centuries ago. But it wasn't until the 1980s uh, and a sort of parallel research development by Professor John Goodenough, uh, a Texan academic working in Oxford University at the time, who was working on cathode materials, which you would have heard about previously in the masterclass this morning. At the same time, Sony were developing um, graphite anodes. And so somehow together, the lithium-ion battery was commercially launched in 1991 to power Sony's camcorder. Many iterations and developments later, and we have much higher capacity uh, cells because the device application has increased. So, you ever wondered why lithium? What's so special about lithium? Well, a bit of basic chemistry. So, basic unit structures of elements, atoms, Lithium atom has three electrons, and the outer electron, lithium atom, is a very electropositive element, and it just can't wait to get rid of that electron. That's why it's so reactive. If you've ever done an experiment where you drop some lithium into water, it goes crazy because it just wants to get rid of that electron. And so electric current charge is made up of electrons. And it literally does give it up spontaneously. But secondly, lithium atom, where it sits in the periodic table, is really small. It's a very, very small atom. And so it can fit inside other materials quite easily. In graphite, it sits between the graphene layers. It can also alloy with metals, and it can also convert through a chemical reaction. So all of these things means that it's got a very high energy density per volume. And so the early demands for portable electronic devices were quite low, such as the Sony camcorder. But these days, of course, we want them to power cars. This is a Tesla, and you can see the difference between the battery packs is quite considerable. 
But electric vehicles are not a new phenomenon. So this rather charming image behind me, 1890, the Morrison Sturgis electric four passenger automobile. Even in the turn of the century, you know, American press, the Washington Post, were talking about, you know, pontificating that prices coming down so that everybody could afford one of these. It's 129 years ago, what happened? Well, the internal combustion engine was a more convenient way of powering uh, automobiles, and it had a long range, because back, back then, the batteries used to power those would have been huge. But now we have the power. But what we don't necessarily have is a charging infrastructure. <coughs> So given that a car battery only has a finite range, it has to be charged more frequently than you'd fill up a petrol tank. And so this is being taken seriously to catalyse the uptake of EVs. And so, so initial investment of 400 million to try to increase and develop a better charging infrastructure so the so-called road to zero, um, it's industrial strategy to try to clean up roads. So quote by Chris Grayling, talking about a better environment with zero emission vehicles. So can electric vehicles really aid or support a green society? So if what we're saying is by going from an internal combustion engine down to an electric motor, we're reducing CO2. It's kind of commonly accepted, right? But to power an electric motor, we need to use a battery. OK, yeah, get that. To power a battery, we need to use electricity, which means we have to burn fossil fuels. So we increase CO2. It doesn't make sense, does it? But the answer is we just need to be smart. It is quite that simple. So part of this is how we use the electricity to charge the batteries. And so overnight charging, for example, it's cheaper for us. And it's off-peak, so it doesn't put too much demand on the grid when most people need it. But with that, if we also feed into the grid by harnessing renewable energy, this again will reduce demand. And so large scale storage of low price energy kind of balances things out and that's called load leveling. But to properly reduce emissions and use EVs efficiently, not only have harnessing uh, renewable energy, but there are other things that can help feed into more localised smart grids. Secondary life for batteries or circular energy storage, as we call it. So, for example, when a car battery uh, loses capacity down to 80% of what it origin originally had, it can be used as a second life in static storage. So this is going to be really important as electric vehicle uptake occurs. And of course, the continued decrease in carbon intensity by virtue of better vehicle technology, that will keep increasing. Also, we have things we can plug into lampposts. So part this is called ubitricity, and a lot of research will help improve the infrastructure and how and where we can charge. This is a, some illustrations of what smart grids potentially look like. So it's literally integrating different supplies of energy so that we can more efficiently use them and not just rely on fossil fuel. We can also do it ourselves. So... This is a Tesla power wall, you can see on the side of that garage. Basically, stores energy from the sun 
is actually made of the same type of cell that goes into a Tesla vehicle. And so this can help to then power the house and trickle charge a car battery. The important thing about what we call trickle charging is that the slower you charge the battery, it's better for the battery. Because when sometimes if you charge a battery too fast, you can plate out lithium, and that is a waste. So I asked the question at the beginning, can batteries drive us to a greener future? And I hope I've partially convinced you that batteries can actually drive us to a greener future. Thank you. <laughs>